Hello, let's start with three take home points that you need to know about gastroschisis. The first one is, is that a gastroschisis is a mostly fixable defect of the abdominal wall with a 90 to 95% survival rate. Number two is that a gastroschisis is normally an isolated lesion. So it's not normally associated with abnormalities in the rest of the body, like with the heart or the kidneys or the brain. And it's not normally associated with genetic issues. And number three is that the intestines can be affected in the gastroschisis. They can be atretic, so just kind of like obstructed. They can be shortened or they can just be really sick and not function well for a really long time. Well, that's pretty much what we're going to be covering today. I'm Dr. Tala and this is Tala Talks NICU. So if that was enough, then just like this video. If you're interested in more neonatal content, then please subscribe to this channel. And if you want to learn more about gastroschisis, that's the plural, by the way, then please stick around. Before I do go on, I want to say a massive thank you to my friend and colleague, Dr. Knox, who basically wrote out the script and then refused to film it, which is a massive loss to you all because she's absolutely beautiful and absolutely brilliant. So I'm not going to stop badgering her. Let's get back on task. So gastroschisis are actually pretty common, about one in 2,000 live births. And if anything, they're becoming even more common. So if you went to a fairly large school, there was probably one kid at your school that had a gastroschisis that you probably didn't even know about. This next point isn't going to mean a lot to a lot of our viewers. It might mean a lot to my two of my nephews. But Jamie Carragher, who was an excellent football player or soccer player for the Americans, who played for both Liverpool as well as England, was born with a gastroschisis. So having a gastroschisis isn't going to stop anybody from being super athletic. I'm sure that there's lots and lots of other famous people that have been born with a gastroschisis, but even if after I extensively Googled, I couldn't find anybody. And by the way, my Google search looks so weird now, like guts outside the body, celebrities born with no belly button. So there's that. So like we said, a gastroschisis is a defect of the abdominal wall. It is one of the two common and serious abdominal wall defects. As you all know, the other one is called an omphalocele, and we'll compare those two a lot throughout this video. In gastroschisis, there is a hole in the abdominal wall on the right side of the abdomen. So the umbilical cord is to the left of the hole. And this hole allows the abdominal contents, mostly the intestines, to come out from the belly, from the peritoneal cavity, and float around in the amniotic fluid during pregnancy. And first comparison, the omphalocele is right in the middle of the body. So again, gastroschisis to the right, the omphalocele is right in the middle of the body. In a gastroschisis, there's no protective membrane that's covering all the intestines and everything, which is why all the intestines can get loose and get out into the amniotic fluid. Whereas in an omphalocele, it normally is covered by a protective membrane. The size of the hole in the gastroschisis can completely vary in size. Normally it's about four centimeters, about, you know, that sort of kind of that you've got no scale to that, but about four centimeters. But the amount of contents that there is outside the belly cavity can really vary. So you can have a lot of intestines or just a few intestines. You can also have other organs like the stomach and the liver and testes. All of it can be out. A gastroschisis is normally an isolated defect. So babies with gastroschisis normally have normal brains, normal kidneys, normal hearts, and probably most importantly, normal genetics so they don't it's not really associated with any other genetic abnormalities there is maybe a slightly increased risk of having congenital heart disease so basically if you have a baby born with a gastroschisis you don't have to go looking immediately for anything else you don't have to order those ultrasounds or send the genes if there is anything abnormal on exam then yes absolutely you should go investigating but not on every baby with a gastroschisis but even though infants with gastroschisis don't really have issues that are unrelated to the gut they're much more likely to have issues with the intestines and this is really logical if you think about it because all the intestines have been floating around in the amniotic fluid and getting boggy and sick so about five to 25 percent large range can have some abnormalities with the intestine, whether there's an atresia, so like there's an actual obstruction in the intestine, 
or whether the gut is really much shorter than it should be for that gestational age. So those types of injuries might be mechanical, so just kind of by being pushed against the fluid and being swirling around where they shouldn't be, that could be affecting the gut, or it could be ischemic. So as the bowel is moving around where it shouldn't, maybe a blood supply kind of got cut off and that area of the gut didn't get the blood that it needed and so didn't grow appropriately. So you can end up with kind of ischemic as well as mechanical injuries to that floating gut. Okay, so we're not really covering on phalloceles today, but everybody is completely obsessed with the difference between gastroschisis and on phalloceles on exams. So let's go through the major differences. So the first one, like we said, the gastroschisis is to the right of the abdomen. The omphalocele is in the center of the abdomen. The umbilicus is normally kind of in the center of the omphalocele. The gastroschisis is normally not covered and the intestines are floating loosely in the amniotic fluid. Omphalocele's are usually covered by a membrane. Then, because they're not covered, gastroschisis are more likely to be associated with issues with the intestines, like atresias or short gut syndrome. The omphalocele's normally don't have any issues with the gut. Gastroschisis are not really associated with defects within other organs, but omphalocele's can be associated with renal, central nervous system, cardiac, and genetic issues. Back to gastroschisis, why do they happen? And the answer to that is nobody really knows, but for whatever reason, gastroschisis are more common in younger mothers. But the good news is, is that most gastroschisis are actually identified prenatally. So on the prenatal ultrasound, you're seeing all those intestines float around in the amniotic fluid. And so it means that the parents, as well as the medical team can be prepared for it. Sometimes if this is tested for, an elevated alpha fetoprotein can also suggest that there's something abnormal going on, like a gastroschisis. A lot of the time, the OBs end up delivering babies with gastroschisis because the bowel wall looks really thickened or even more commonly, it's just become really distended. So really, a lot of these babies don't get to term. Most gastroschisis babies are born in late preterm, so somewhere between 34 and 36 and six weeks. These babies don't have to be delivered by C-section. Vaginal delivery is fine, and this has been proven in, in many studies. I will tell you though, that these babies do have a slightly lower threshold to be delivered by C-section rather than kind of another late preterm baby. So what do we actually do in the delivery room? Well, really our goal in the delivery room is to try to prevent further damage to that gut and to prevent dehydration. So because as we keep saying, that bowel is just exposed to air, then a lot of fluid can be lost from it and these babies can get dehydrated easily and they can get infected and that bowel can be injured even more. When the babies are born, the bowel that you see looks really like swollen and matted, like they kind of look like big sausages. And to protect them as quickly as possible, you want to put them in a translucent surgical bag. So it's kind of like, we also call it a bowel bag. It's a, a bag that you put over the legs, over the belly, and then kind of kinch it around under the armpits. And that will prevent further dehydration and hopefully prevent further injury to the bowel. It's important that the bag itself is actually translucent or like clear and colorless so that you can actually look at the intestines and make sure that they're healthy. So you want them to be nice, a nice pink color or a red color. If they look like they're getting dusky or they're going a blue color, then what you worry about is that the vascular supply is cut off. That's a big emergency and you have to try to kind of position the baby trying to get that blood supply back to the intestines. Sometimes putting the baby in kind of like a lateral position, so on its side, really helps take the extra pressure off those intestines. The other thing you should be doing in the delivery room is putting in a repogal to suction. So putting in a gavage tube from the mouth that goes down to the stomach and suctioning up all the excess fluid and air that like literally has nowhere to go. So that should be done very soon after delivery too. If these babies have any respiratory distress, and honestly, a lot of them do just because they are late preterm, then it's better to go ahead and actually intubate these babies. Because if you think about it, if you put them under CPAP and you've got that mask blowing air into their lungs, it's also blowing air down into their stomach and into their intestines, which really has nowhere to go and it could like make the intestines get any bigger. So if the baby does need respiratory support, have a low threshold to intubate. 
once you get to the unit, really the most important thing that you need to do is get an IV. So we can't really use the umbilical vessels because it's kind of so close to the gastroschisis. So ask your best IV placer to put an IV as soon as this baby gets to the unit. You probably need to start antibiotics, although recently there's been kind of more discussions about this, but you definitely need to start IV fluids. And I know that you know this, but normally we start IV fluids at 60 to 80 mLs per kilo. But in these babies, because there's so much fluid loss through all the gut, then we're normally starting at about between 80 to 120 mLs per kilo per day of IV fluids. And this is one of the few situations where after birth, we actually start fluids with a bit of sodium in it, because again, sodium is being lost along with the rest of the fluid. So normally we'll start D10 and maybe a quarter normal saline. These babies are normally NPO for some time, at least a couple of weeks, um, usually even longer than that. So they will need a central line for prolonged TPN access or total parenteral nutrition. So whether you can get a pick line in amongst the chaos at the beginning, or whether you ask your friendly surgeon to put in a Broviac, the baby is going to need a central line. As soon as you know that the gastroschisis is about to be delivered, then just call your surgeon and give them a heads up. It really is one of the few things that they need to be there shortly after delivery. So because prolonged exposure of the bowel to the air is not a good thing, the goal of surgery is always to try to close it primarily. So basically, as soon as the surgeon comes in to kind of squash all the intestines back into the belly cavity and then close it. And there's loads of different techniques which are changing all the time about how they close it. But that's always the goal. Sometimes, however, the intestines are so large that it's almost impossible to squash them all back in one go and to just close the defect. This could be because it just ends up with too much pressure in the belly, or it could also be because it's kind of pushing up on the lungs so much that it's now making it really hard for the babies to breathe. So in those situations, they don't do the surgery in one go. They do something called a staged procedure. So they do the procedure in stages. In a staged closure, the surgeon puts all the intestine into this like translucent long cylindrical silicone bag. We also call it a silo bag. And the base of this silo bag has this kind of like, it's a circular spring that they tuck right under the hole into the skin. And then every day they squash the intestines a little bit more into the peritoneal cavity. So it's kind of suspended above the babies and they push it in a little bit more every day so that the belly cavity is slowly kind of stretching out and the baby is slowly getting used to having all its intestines inside its abdomen. The longest time that you can actually use a silo bag for is about two weeks because after that, the risk of infections, especially cellulitis, goes through the roof. Once the defect is closed, we are basically just waiting. We're waiting for return of bowel function. And in the meantime, we're supporting them with total parenteral nutrition. So with good nutrition going directly into the blood. So how can we tell that bowel function has actually returned? Well, if you recall, what we talked about earlier was putting in a repogal or that gavage tube to suction, which is constantly sucking stuff out from the stomach, which is kind of building up from the intestines. Remember that the intestines themselves produce a lot of secretions and the bile duct with all the bile, the green bile, drains into the intestines as well. So if that bowel isn't working, so isn't digesting and absorbing, and most importantly, it isn't kind of squeezing everything forward, then all those fluids, including the bowel, the bile, will just build up within the intestines and then go upwards towards the stomach and get sucked out. So when the gut isn't working, we're gonna have a lot of fluid draining from the stomach, normally a greenish fluid. As that bowel starts working better or the process of peristalsis improves, then instead of that fluid all kind of going upwards, it will start going down the intestines in an appropriate way. So we'll have less and less fluid and much lighter fluid, so it won't be green any longer, that will be coming out of the gavage tube. So that's one thing we're looking for, the decrease of bilious secretions from the repogal tube. The other thing that we're looking for, for return of bowel function, is the presence of bowel sound. So when you put on a stethoscope and listen to the belly, you can hear the rumbling of the belly. 
That is actually what you're hearing there is peristalsis, which means that the bowel has started actually working again. And as you can expect, a really good sign of good bowel function is that the baby actually poops. So those are really the three things that we're looking for. Decreased in bilious output from the Repogol, the presence of bowel sounds, and the baby stooling. Those are all signs that maybe the baby is ready to start small feeds. Babies with gastroschisis have notorious GI motility issues, so it can take a long time for those intestines to start feeling better and actually start working. So the wait might be a couple of weeks, it might even be a month. When we do start feeds and just kind of like a preemie baby, we start small amounts and then slowly advance very slowly. So just kind of like a preemie baby. Once the baby is tolerating full feeds orally, then at that point, the baby should be ready to go home. Normally, the entire hospitalization takes about a month. It can be shorter than this. I think my record is about 16 days, which was a complete anomaly. Um, but if the babies do have issues with their gut, whether they're atretic or they've got issues with short gut syndrome, then babies can be in hospital for many, many months. Sometimes when the surgeons are actually doing the primary closure, they take a good look at the intestines and they can tell whether there's an area of obstruction or something and they can fix that. But other times, we really don't know if there's something wrong with the intestine until we actually start feeds. And sometimes they don't go well at all. If that is the case, that baby is just not tolerating any feeds, getting abdominal distension and puking a lot whenever we try to feed the baby, then we have to do a contrast study. So put kind of like a radio opaque dye into the intestines and follow it through with serial x-rays or fluoroscopy to see where that dye kind of ends up. If it ends up stopping somewhere, then we have to assume that this baby has an obstruction and the baby will need surgery again so that they can go in, um, do an x lap and actually figure out what's going on. Like we said, even though there can be intestinal complications with gastroschisis, most babies do really, really well and have normal growth and development by the ages of one to two. Okay, so that was kind of like gastroschisis in a nutshell. Again, thank you, Dr. Knox. If this video was at all helpful, then please like it. And if you're interested in neonatal education, then please subscribe to this channel. Tell us where you're from when you're writing to us. We love hearing about it. Again, thank you so much for being here.